the voluntary carbon market, while it is very nascent and lacks transparency, it has actually been around for decades. But we do believe that 2023 is going to be a critical evolutionary year for this market. There are some transformational changes that are going on. And I think that companies that can position themselves appropriately in advance of these changes will ultimately benefit. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building smarter markets be the antidote? This episode is brought to you in part by Base Carbon. It's time to get serious on carbon. Learn more at basecarbon.com. Welcome back to Carbon Frontiers on Smarter Markets. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at ABEX Technologies. Our guest today is Rachel Walsh. Rachel is the Carbon Innovation Analyst within Equity Research at BMO Capital Markets. We'll be discussing how recent press coverage of voluntary carbon markets is affecting the companies that participate in them, how companies are using the voluntary carbon markets to meet net zero commitments, and the big trends that will help determine where we go from here. Hello, Rachel. Welcome to Smarter Markets. I wanted to first this thank you for being here. And, you know, as a former analyst myself, I wanted to ask you if you could start us off by telling us a little about your work. You're the Carbon Innovation Analyst at BMO Capital Markets. And I was curious, how would you describe your role and your coverage area? Well, thank you, David. And first off, I do just want to say thank you to Smarter Markets. Uh, This does continue to be one of my favorite podcasts, and I'm very humbled by the opportunity to be a guest on this show. But in terms of my role as Carbon Innovation Analyst at BMO, you know, there are two main facets to my coverage. So first, from a thematic perspective, I cover anything that puts a price on carbon, whether that be explicitly or implicitly. So that would include things like carbon markets, both compliance carbon markets and the voluntary market, clean fuel standards, as well as tax credits for low carbon technologies. And then the other part of my coverage includes the many technologies and companies that will generate revenue through these carbon price mechanisms. Now, I do believe that I am one of the only dedicated carbon analysts on the sell side, and I think that speaks to BMO's dedication uh, toward being a thought leader on the subject of carbon. Well, this is great because now we can have a really wide-ranging conversation about the carbon markets, which is what I was looking forward to. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess in the interest of full disclosure, I should mention that you cover Base Carbon, which is one of our sponsors here at Smarter Markets. And so I won't ask you any specific questions about Base Carbon, but I do want to get your thoughts on some of the big trends affecting your coverage area, which is, as you said, the carbon markets broadly. One of those is the recent negative stories on certain aspects of the voluntary carbon markets from certain parts of the media. And I was curious, how are you assessing those stories? You know, are they accurate? And are they highlighting an important problem? Yeah, so just for the benefit of our listeners, I think it would help to point out one of the main criticisms from these articles. And it has been the potential for overcrediting in certain project types within the voluntary market, largely targeted at red plus credits. And that stands for reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. That can really just be thought of as a credit type that represents conservation for certain uh, natural ecosystems. Now, there's a lot to unpack here in this discussion, but first on the accuracy component, uh, the technique that these articles relies on heavily, which uses synthetic controls to create a proxy area uh, for developing baselines, this is seemingly flawed. But I do think it speaks to the challenges with measurement in certain parts of carbon markets, uh, especially when subjective analysis is required to determine base case scenarios. So this base case, what it represents is the situation that would have occurred without the carbon project in existence. And this is the basis from which we measure. So in other words, it will ultimately determine the total volume of credits that are issued under a certain program from the registries. 
As you can imagine, there is no perfect science in predicting the future. And ultimately, rates of deforestation are going to be subject to things like behavioral changes, uh, economic impacts within communities. And these are things that are really challenging to predict. So while the main registry in question has pushed back against these allegations, they've also reacted by announcing that they will be streamlining and improving their red methodologies to ensure that they are applied consistently and to also ensure that they reflect best practices. I personally think that this is a healthy reaction to this criticism. You know, I have consistently stated that growth in this market is ultimately going to be predicated on its ability to provide high integrity products. I think even the impression of low quality, whether it's warranted or not, could negatively impact demand in the voluntary market. Purchases in this market reflect voluntary action, and if corporate reputations are at risk, demand is ultimately going to dry up. But I do just want to make two other points on the topic because I think that these negative articles really miss the point for a few reasons. First off, the use case for these credits is not even considered, which is critical in my mind. You know, these articles claim that this market facilitates greenwashing, but for that to be true, these credits would need to be used to assist with false or inflated claims on the part of the buyer. You know, we looked at disclosures from all of the corporations that are mentioned in this article. We find that this is largely not the case, as these companies seem committed to lowering their emissions internally before even considering the use of these offsets. And then one last major point of contention that I have with these articles is that they tend to identify issues with the voluntary carbon market, but then fail to provide any alternatives. You know, according to the IPCC, Deforestation and forest degradation represents 11% of global anthropogenic emissions. I think it's really important to consider that there is an opportunity cost for these communities when they choose not to develop their natural ecosystems. Whatever the issues are with Red Plus credits, I have yet to see a better method of climate finance that compensates these communities for this and for the volume of carbon that remains stored in these reservoirs. This is really important in jurisdictions where government regulation is lacking, and this is clearly the case in many places around the world where we see rampant deforestation. And I'd like to just highlight a couple of the points you made because I think they're they're quite important. The first is there's been no allegation that the measurement has been mismeasured on what was cut down versus what wasn't cut down, right? So the, the argument is strictly about the counterfactual of, well, that wouldn't have gotten cut down anyway. Yeah, exactly. Which, of course, counterfactuals are tough. And then the other is, in fairness to the registries, a lot of the, the progress on continually improving the red methodologies has been in progress for quite some time. I know some of the articles stated that it was indirect reaction implicitly to the story, but this is something that's been going on for probably the better part of a decade, is my yeah. understanding. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. These registries continue to improve their methodologies across the board as the science develops and, as you mentioned, the counterfactual changes as well. And I wanted to ask you, because I, I found it a really interesting point around how corporations are actually using these credits in line with their overall net zero approach. Because as you said, it's a, these have been a very important way to get carbon finance to preserve ecosystems that could otherwise be in danger. And so I was curious from your vantage point, how has the recent press coverage and the underlying issues themselves been affecting corporate net zero behavior? and the availability of carbon finance? So I would say that we have seen increased hesitancy on the part of the buyer of offsets, and that can be observed through the drop in overall volume traded in the voluntary market. Again, this market does facilitate voluntary action to lower net emissions, and you know any element of reputational risk here is gonna cause hesitation. But I would also say that the apparent pullback in demand is also being compounded by inflation and increasing interest rates. You know, while companies are still working to reduce their emissions, it seems that these initiatives, especially offsetting, has fallen in priority. 
And that is a direct result of the changing priorities from both investors and consumers, with investors choosing to focus uh, more acutely on near-term financial results and returns, and consumers prioritizing affordability in the near term. You know, as a result, it's difficult to quantify the exact volume that's being driven away by negative press, but we are seeing it to some degree. One behavior that is an indication of this is something that is called green hushing. And this is where companies might still be engaging in these green initiatives, but they are not advertising them outwardly as much. Uh, and that's just to avoid potential scrutiny. You know, For example, some companies are beginning to make statements like they are spending uh, $1 million to protect the rainforest in certain jurisdictions instead of mentioning the total tonnage of credits purchased. You know, you're not mentioning specific volume that leads to less scrutiny overall. You know, in addition to that, I would say an increasing number of corporations are now kind of waiting for official guidelines on offsettings to emerge just so that they have something to point to to say that they are using offsets appropriately. We do expect one of these to be released by the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative in the coming months, which could act as a catalyst for demand for corporate buyers in our mind. But we do think that there is a consensus that has formed around offsetting best practices and that thoughtful offsetting can take place in the meantime uh, before the VCMI does release those official guidelines. It's it's uh, fascinating that the carbon markets, although they're still very young, they're already susceptible to typical market forces like interest rates and financial cycles. I wanted to ask you, in all the stories, the issues around greenwashing, green hushing, to some extent, we're seeing competing narratives over kind of a common set of facts or a common set of events. And I was curious on your view of it. Do you see the voluntary carbon markets as more of a tool or more of a threat to achieving net zero and why? Yeah, I do think that these competing narratives are unfortunate given the need for immediate action in order to meet these ambitious climate goals. You know, while I think it's completely necessary to address issues that exist in these markets and improvements that need to take place, you know, it also needs to be realized that they are an effective and critical tool to help reach net zero. And this is for many reasons, but just to quote a few of them, based on current emissions projections, CO2 will have to be removed from the atmosphere to meet temperature goals. In my mind, carbon markets represent one of the most efficient ways to finance these removal activities. And these activities would include things like planting trees and even direct air carbon capture, which I'm sure as some listeners are aware is extremely expensive. In addition, uh, the net in net zero does imply that some degree of offsetting will be required. And this is because the complete elimination of some emission sources is not technologically feasible. And those carbon emissions are going to have to be removed from the atmosphere as a result. And then lastly, I think it's really important to consider how efficient market-based mechanisms are at reducing emissions at the lowest possible cost. Not all companies or nations can reduce emissions at the same cost. You know, by creating a tradable, fungible carbon market, emitters can finance lower cost options near term while they wait on technological breakthroughs that are required for some of their more expensive internal opportunities. This is going to result in more significant reductions near term with the same amount of capital investment. Uh, to put it into context, the International Emissions Trading Association has a figure that I love to quote. They estimate that if we had a functional international carbon market, and to be clear, uh, we will not any time near term, but if we did, it could drive cost savings of $250 billion U.S. just in reaching the 2030 goals under the Paris Agreement. If that capital were reinvested, that could potentially result in an additional five gigatons of annual emissions reductions, which would represent about 8% of global emissions. That's very significant near term. I love that figure that you use also, especially when you convert it from the dollars saved, which many people don't necessarily see that as the most important thing. But when you see it as when you reinvest that, how much more carbon you can remove from the atmosphere. And 8% of annual emissions is a big figure in terms of the additional carbon emissions that could be reduced or removed. 
Yeah, and I do think it's important to consider a lot of those opportunities, they don't have access to capital. So the redistribution of capital through a market-based system, you know, that is what is creating those additional reductions. And I was curious, when you look at the companies and their approaches right now, whether it's on those traditional industries trying to reduce emissions or, you know, some of the newer companies that you cover that are more focused on carbon reduction projects. What do you see as the current best practices? And how do you think about if a company is approaching things the right way? So as I did mention, there are no official guidelines at the moment, currently waiting for those, but there are several sources of best practices when it comes to corporate offsetting. Just to touch on some of the more salient points that form a consensus there, all of them state that high quality offsets should be purchased and that offsetting should be used as a last resort. So just to break down what that means, companies need to follow an emission mitigation hierarchy. These mitigation hierarchies are not new. Uh, You can think of the popular reduce, reuse, recycle slogan that we all know very well. And these hierarchies ensure that externalities are being reduced in the most impactful way possible. So to be specific here, This means that a company would first need to avoid emissions from the onset, and this can be done by incorporating carbon pricing into project models to have a more holistic view of project economics overall. Then a company will need to reduce emissions, at which point the company can then uh, consider substituting or replacing carbon intensive energy sources with low carbon sources where possible. Now, at some point, all of these options are either not going to be technologically feasible or the cost of doing these is going to become preventative. At that point in time, the emitter can then consider offsets to address the amount of emissions that is remaining. But again, the company should do its best to reduce emissions internally before even considering offsetting. In contrast, if we were to think of an extreme example where a company was doing absolutely nothing to lower their emissions footprint and then using offsets excessively and claiming that they had achieved net neutrality, you know, that certainly would be considered greenwashing and should not be encouraged in this market. Yeah, I know the the hierarchy is definitely one that people adhere to. As an economist by training, it's always struck me a little bit strange. You know, I just think of it in terms of Am I supposed to raise my own food or sew my own clothing until it's just too hard and then I'm allowed to go and, and buy it in the market? But I, I see where people are coming from in terms of you know wanting to make sure that people are really making a good faith effort to reduce their own emissions first. But I guess I can't get by the economics training. Maybe moving on, I was curious, you know, in what areas do you see carbon offsets being used well? Because I think sometimes even with the carbon hierarchy, you know, there's the presumption that they're not going to be used well. And that's why you need to do it internally first. But what areas do you see them being used well? And then also, where are they being used poorly? So, you know, I just touched on the need to reduce emissions and then use offsets as a last resort. But in order for us to observe that, that best practices are indeed taking place, it's going to require a company having detailed and robust disclosures when it comes to both emissions and offsets. So specifically, that's going to require the disclosure of the role of offsetting by an emitter and then reference, specific reference that they are being used as a last resort. In addition to that, a company's emissions volume need to be disclosed separately from the volume of offsets. And that's in order for stakeholders to really view that a company is actually making progress on those internal emissions reductions. Both of these might ultimately be required by the SEC, interestingly enough, and we're going to get some clarity on those rules for emissions disclosure uh, potentially in the coming weeks. I do find that the poor use of offsets is usually tied to limited or no disclosure. And as a result of that, you know, it's not observable for me to see if offsets are being used as a last resort. But I would also include offsetting at checkout under a poor use of offsets. And this is simply because I do not think that the average consumer has the level of education that's required to understand the overall impact from their consumption behaviors. You know, even in a circumstance where they are pairing that consumption with offsets, ultimately, if they did, they might choose not to consume. And the idea that they might be able to completely offset their impact can have kind of false state of confidence from the consumer in a sense of what their net impact is. 
And as an example of offsetting at checkout, we do see that provided by certain airlines while purchasing flight tickets for consumers and then also at the pump at some fueling stations. Now, obviously, this education level on the appropriate mitigation hierarchy for consumers could be improved over time, you know, just as the reduce, reuse, recycle slogan was amplified. But at the moment, I think that's missing. And does it seem like that's connected to those being perhaps more marketing strategies than like the real operational strategy of the company? Yeah, I think so. I think it does give the consumer some comfort in their purchase. And, you know, overall, it is a low dollar percentage of their overall purchase. So it's a very easy decision for the consumer to make. Now, I will say that these corporations do disclose that uh, the purchase of offsetting is not a perfect replacement of consumption behaviors. But I really doubt that the consumer is going on to each individual website and seeking out those disclosures. Yeah, I think that would uh, be my behavior, I think. <laughs> uh, and I said, as a former analyst, I know often one of the, the challenges of the role is being able to get the information you need to make proper assessments. You mentioned, you know, the SEC may be coming out with some more rules for more disclosure. What do you see as like the state of information now? Like, how much do you think you're getting roughly relative to what you'd like on the wish list? I mean, so I have gone into deep analysis on this. We checked disclosures for the entire BMO coverage universe, which is over 900 companies. And we found that generally, specifically in terms of offsetting, uh, disclosure was lacking or non-existent. So there does need to be improvement there, I would say, overall. To no surprise, it got better as market cap increased. But I think that just speaks to the level of sophistication within certain companies. You know, we do believe that disclosure requirements are only going to increase. You can see this as a result of the SEC decision that's coming. And ultimately, I think that's going to drive demand into higher quality parts of the market, which uh, leads to our thesis that there's a greater degree of price appreciation potential in those higher quality parts of the carbon market as a result. And I wanted to get a sense from you of how do you evaluate the companies that you cover? I, I know you started off covering E&Ps in the oil and gas sector. So I was curious, like, what's your framework for thinking about these companies and how similar or different is it to, you know, what you learned in the E&P side? Yeah, I guess uh, my E&P background might give away my strategy for coming up with the target price here, but I, I do tend to be quite conservative overall when determining the value of these companies. And I rely entirely on net asset value to come up with my target price. And this is ultimately the output of a discounted cash flow model where I only include revenue from existing agreements. I don't ascribe any value to additional potential streams of revenue or letters of intent, things of that nature. And I would consider those to just be additional upside to my target. Now, I've chosen to do that for two reasons. I do want my targets to be grounded in current reality. And then I also do find that there's upside in these companies based on these very conservative assumptions. But, uh, you know, as we've discussed, another part of my pitch here, uh, we see the potential for reputational risk on the part of corporate buyers when engaging in this voluntary carbon market. And that has been part of my pitch for engaging in companies like Base Carbon or the other streaming like business models that do exist. And this is because they provide a layer of due diligence for both corporate buyers and also the investors that are looking to get exposure in these markets. These companies are partnering with project developers. They know that these are high quality projects and they do have a level of comfort when engaging with project partners. And we've talked about, you know, a couple of the big forces that are affecting the companies that you cover, the reputational risks, some of the negative media coverage, some of the economic cycle that we're in currently. But I'm curious, like, are there other big forces that are affecting these companies that we should be keeping in mind? Yeah, I have alluded to a couple, but I'll, I'll spell them out in plain language here. The voluntary carbon market, while it is very nascent and lacks transparency, it has actually been around for decades. But we do believe that 2023 is going to be a critical evolutionary year for this market. There are some transformational changes that are going on. And I think that companies that can position themselves appropriately in advance of these changes will ultimately benefit. And, you know, the opposite is also true for the ones that are unable to do that. So, you know, specifically, 
Some important items include the release of the core carbon principles, which we saw just a few weeks ago. We're still waiting on details from the assessment framework and project specific items. And this is released from the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Markets, which was born from the task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets. They realized that if they were going to scale them, they needed to improve the integrity of these markets. So ultimately, this initiative is going to result in certain crediting programs and projects receiving official tagging from this group, which for short form I'll refer to as the ICVCM. If these credits are able to receive this tagging, it's going to reflect that those projects represent the utmost quality in this market and meet a certain level of standard of credit quality. I think as a result of that, you know, these credits are going to be highly sought after by buyers and are going to receive a price premium as a result. In contrast, credits that fail to receive that taking could drop in value. Other elements that have caused some turbulence in this market are the collision of domestic compliance carbon markets and the voluntary market. You know, under the rules of the Paris Agreement, and I won't go into much detail here to spare a listener, but uh, through something called Article 6, you know, it appears that governments do have a certain degree of control when it comes to approving the export of voluntary credits. We've seen some interference in Indonesia, as well as India in certain project types, and this has led to the restriction of export of credits for some project developers. Now, while the details on Article 6 have yet to be finalized, it does remain difficult to predict where these restrictions will uh, occur as well. Its existence creates an element of risk in these markets, but it also creates an opportunity as well. You know, similar to the ICVCM tagging, we believe if a credit can receive Article 6 tagging, which would mean that it's been approved for export by nation states, we think that that could garner a premium in the market. So certainly some material developments going on in this market. We believe that companies that can position themselves well will benefit. But, you know, we do expect that we'll receive continued clarity on these items in the coming months. And I wanted to ask you a question about the core carbon principles from the ICVCM. This might be asking you for a hot take as they, you know, only come out recently. But in terms of companies that would be looking to meet that standard or get that tagging, is it fairly operationalized? Like if you were to say, oh, this credit meets that standard, how hard is it to show that at this point? I think the ICVCM does intend to look at things from the program level, and that's going to come out in a phased approach. So we expect the first uh, programs will be receiving ICVCM approval in the third quarter, and then you'll see uh, a step change from there as they're able to look at more and more types. I would say that just because something receives tagging first doesn't mean that it represents the utmost quality. It might simply be easier for the ICVCM to interpret, and that might include things like credits that reflect technologies, because as we've mentioned with some of the conservation programs, those are more difficult to measure. The measurability of certain technologies is a lot easier, and so it might just be a function of that. That's great. Thank you. So we've talked about some of the big forces and how they might be impacting the types of companies and the actual companies that are in the market right now. But I was curious, you know, when you look at them, do you see it changing the number of companies and the nature of the types of companies that you cover? I guess in particular, do you see gaps in the market that's creating opportunities for new types of companies? So I think in terms of both the number and nature, it all ties back to the state of capital markets and specifically the public equity markets. And each corporations, you know, want and need to engage in those markets. You know, I do believe there are currently several private companies that are kind of waiting in the wings for things to recover. So this would include more uh, streaming and royalty companies potentially that engage in both the voluntary and compliance carbon markets. But it also uh, may include some technology companies that might be looking to access capital markets in order to grow in the future. And then when it comes to energy transition, I do think that there are many gaps that create opportunities for companies here. The act of transitioning a business to a low carbon intensity one is extremely complex, and we are seeing a ton of startups emerging through different verticals here. You can see it through measurement and accounting of emissions, which might surprise some people is actually a very difficult task. 
you know, once a company is able to measure their emissions, then they can start to make a plan on, you know, the most effective ways for them to address those emissions, which then includes an understanding of the technologies available to them and the costs of those options as well. So both an opportunity on the measurement as well as the advisory side of that business. You know, companies may also uh, mitigate the costs of these activities to some degree through the creation of things like compliance carbon credits, as an example. But that alone requires its own level of expertise and understanding the complexities that come with carbon credit origination. And then once all those uh, options have been exhausted, you know, the company might look to purchase uh, different forms of offsets, both in compliance and voluntary markets. So I think while the direction of travel might be clear here for energy transition, the specific expertise required at each step are really underappreciated. And in my mind, they do create a lot of opportunity for emerging businesses. You know, I would like to mention uh, that BMO fully appreciates this, and that's part of the reason they chose to purchase a business that specializes in all of these items through the purchase of Radical Balance. And I guess that's a good lead into the, the last question I'd like to ask you today, and thank you for being here with us, which is, how do you see your space, the carbon innovation space, evolving over the next few years with all these opportunities and, all, and the big forces operating on them? You know, I do think, and I, I kind of alluded to it, but as equity markets improve, we're going to see a lot of key technology companies come to market here. At the moment, there are several of them that are taking their technology from pilot to commercial stage, and they may be looking uh, to the markets in the future for growth capital. You know, in addition to that, I do believe that the carbon markets that these companies will be generating revenue in are going to mature. And as a result of that, uh, there's going to be more credibility from investors and corporations. That's ultimately going to drive growth in these markets. And we anticipate that growth will be very significant in the coming years and decades. Thanks again to Rachel Walsh, Carbon Innovation Analyst with Inequity Research at BMO Capital Markets. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Join us next week as we continue to explore the carbon frontier on Smarter Markets. We hope you'll join us. This episode is brought to you in part by Base Carbon. The trading of carbon credits can help companies and the world meet ambitious goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But how do we judge the quality of these projects? And how can we ensure that our investments are creating real value? At Base Carbon, we're focused on financing and facilitating the transition to net zero through trusted and transparent partners. It's time to focus on what's important. It's time to get serious on carbon. Learn more at basecarbon.com. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by Abax. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, Abax Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening and please join us again next week. 